Welcome back, friends. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate all your really insightful presentations earlier today. Um, Chris Edgar, Edgar, Edgar. Huh? Edgar. Edgar, awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to chatting. And uh, there are a couple of things that came up for me and I just wanna maybe throw some questions for you both and then we can jump into the chat. So if folks have questions for either Chris or Edgar, you can drop them in and I will do my best to make sure they get answered in the time we have. Um, and just overall with this section of Dirty Mind presentations, I think that one, some of the kind of recurring themes for me as I watched was this idea of Dirty Mind as protest music. Uh, and this notion of protest from so many different aspects of protesting conformity, protesting the status quo, uh, politics, sex and sexuality, religion, race, uh, both affirming and protesting the ways in which we look at those things. Uh, and Edgar, you talked a lot about it from the perspective of building, which I thought is really phenomenal because so much of what Prince's music is, is about the aesthetic and creating an idea, an image, a presentation of what the music is supposed to look like, the feeling of it, the texture. And Chris, there's like a similar perspective in thinking about the intersectionality of politics and that image and how that played out in the music. So I was really curious to hear from both of you in particular about um, thinking about how gender and sexuality plays into the way that Prince thought of his image, thought about aesthetic and world building. Because I think, I mean, just beyond the, the lyrics of a song, the the way that he presented himself on stage was gender bending so to speak and the having the members of his band who are you know queer and even the men in the the band who were kind of who played with the masculinity and talked in the way in which he presented ways so i'd love to hear your perspectives on from these different entry points about gender and sexuality you first chris huh. sure um well yeah i mean it's I love this question because it is so much part of, of Prince and particularly like as a queer kid who grew up seeing him like that. You know, for me and what my world was, I for for so many years, I don't know how long, I just thought that any male person who liked Prince was gay because that was like my relationship to Prince. Um, and it was such a, a strong relationship. Uh, delay in your egg are you experiencing a delay in the feed uh, a little bit okay let's try again go for us let's maybe maybe it caught up all right yeah, I heard a little bit of feedback are we any better um okay I'll try it so the what was I oh so you know and obviously just because of his appearance being so, um, you know, not traditionally masculine. Um, I think there's been so much thought about it. And what I really appreciate is with the Morris Day book, um, and then last night with Andre to hear people who were there talk about um, his intentionality around his, around that appearance. And with that idea of really playing with that, that there was, you know, I think even in today's music, that is just would is not typical for someone who does not identify um, as you know anything on the queer spectrum to be so willing to let people think that maybe they are to have that question hang over them, and that you know to this day I think there are people who still you know like just casual audience are like oh Prince is gay, and just because of how he looked you know so it's. That, you know, is such a vital part, appearance of how we are, you know, how we express ourselves to the world. So for someone like Prince, who, you know, from like what Edgar talked about, being so intentional about everything he did and how he was presented, um, that that just in itself was, yeah, protest and rebellion and incredibly inclusive to do that. So, yeah, that's kind of my take on on the clothing and the the gender aspect hmm. but the, the funny thing is uh, i see a, 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 a question from stein uh, uh, asking uh, how prince was uh, received when he was in the netherlands uh, for the first time his first non-us show was was uh, in the netherlands um, and the thing is that uh, he also uh, um, well he bended all the rules back then back, they, uh, 
in the early 1980s, you had this uh, this Suriname um, uh, scene in the Netherlands, and they were all masculine black men. That was well the status quo. That's how a black man was supposed to be. And then Prince came along with the trench coat, with the with the bikini briefs, and it he totally flipped the 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 the, the scene. And the, the most funny thing uh, is that um, it was all image. Um, Amsterdam uh, was, of course, still, of course, uh, is is a city that's uh, famous for the red light district. And I really like the story that when Prince first visited Amsterdam, his whole band went on the town, went to the red light district, and Prince didn't dare to go. He he just stayed in his hotel room. He was afraid to go out in 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 well in the area that looks exactly like he was presenting himself on stage. So he his image was not really. Uh, exactly how he was uh, as himself, and that 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 well, uh, yeah, that's that's really an, an interesting contrast, I think. So he was presenting something, he was bending the rules, he was showing other people this is how you can be as as a male, um, and then at the same time, he was so shy that he didn't want to go out uh, into a district that looked exactly the way he was dressing. So it's 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 very interesting uh, to. To, to have the, the image of Prince at one side um, and a very influential uh, image as it was uh, really uh, well breaking the rules and at the other uh, at the other end of the spectrum you have the person Prince who is slightly less um, wild as he was uh, perceived I think there's that duality absolutely that you're talking about there's like kind of this religious upbringing that he had that played into the music but then there was also the image that he was presenting and I think sometimes those things worked harmoniously and sometimes those things were kind of battling each other. So it's really interesting that you frame it that way. Um, Chris, there is a great question in the, in the chat yeah. asking, um, where do you think the perception about his sexuality came from? Were there like sp specific signs that he was giving off to, to, you know, convey this idea of like having a queer sexuality? Um, well, I think it's, you know, just basic uh, homophobia and just close mindedness that it's, it, you know, particularly at that time, a man wearing high heels and eyeliner, um, just, he just didn't look conventionally masculine or heterosexual in how, um, how society reads people. Um, and that was a very natural, like automatic of like, oh, if you don't look like this and you conduct yourself in this way, then that's what you are. Um, and I think, you know, particularly like what uh, uh, Andre said last night, that um, that he was OK with that and intentional. And even that, you know, that people would show up to a concert and be like, wow, we don't really know who he is or what he is. But like by the third song, it's like, oh, yeah, he's all about the ladies. Like, and it was fine. Like, it was what was so powerful about him to really be OK in that space, because that, you know, with traditional like fragile masculinity, most straight men, you know, which it's weird to say straight. I think Prince is very queer, but also definitely you know, heterosexual. Um, and most heterosexual men would not want to be perceived by it as being gay or possibly being gay or questioning. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, again, homophobia and just the idea of very little room for anything different than what people are used to. I love that, the that he's heterosexual, but was a queer man. Like that's, I mean, I think that's a great, the idea that he plays with the notions of gender, but clearly had a preference for, or at least by his music, we he had a preference for uh, who his partners were. So that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. There was another uh, good comment that came up earlier. It was from actually from Arthur, uh, Arthur Turnbull, who popped in the comments uh, during uh, Edgar's, presentation and mentioned that you are the, you spoke to the manager of the Trojan Horse and the Hog, and yeah. you're not you not only held and photographed the ad, actual source recording from the cassette tapes, but you heard the playback from those tapes. So can you talk a yeah. little bit about that? <laughs> well, I, I wrote um, I wrote a book about uh, all Prince's endeavors in the Netherlands, because uh, somehow there was this bond between Prince and the Netherlands, uh, especially in the 1980s. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, his first non-US show was here. 
Um, the Science of Times movie uh, was originally filmed here uh, when the Love Sexy show uh, had to be broadcast worldwide. He had uh, buses full of Dutch fans going to Germany because he wanted that Dutch audience there. So there was this, um, uh, well, bond between Prince and, and the Netherlands. And that's what my that's what my book is, uh, is about. Um, and um, while doing research for the book, I really wanted to know how that recording came out because it's one of the most famous bootlegs uh, there is. And uh, and it's, 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 it was one of the first soundboard bootlegs everybody had heard. And I think everybody knows and loves that, that show uh, because of what it is. Um, so I made an appointment with uh, the, the director of, of the venue just to hear his story. And then about half an hour in, he casually mentioned, well, I have the original tapes back here. Um, so, and, and, and actually, uh, the, 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 the tapes are uh, that mythical that you expect something very spectacular, but it's just two cassettes with, with a handwritten note on it that it's part one of the show and part two of the show. But also, yeah. it was glowing, right? So when it got handed to you, the cassette tapes had a glow and aura. That whole yeah, thing. glow and the confetti everywhere. <laughs> it was <laughs> magical. No, but, but, but what, what, what I really liked uh, about it was... Uh, it made uh, a, a mythical a recording. It made it human again. It's it just, yeah. I heard the story about how uh, Prince's team came in, swooped the entire place for cameras, for for recording uh, equipment, anything. They put out all the lamps and all the light bulbs to see if there had been any recordings. So so the whole place was stripped before Prince came, and then there was this one guy um, who just had. Well, balls of steel, I should say, because he just plugged into the soundboard, stood next to it, and uh, he was actually uh, working at the venue, and he recorded the whole thing onto two TDK cassettes, and it's really, really fun to to see those 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 things and to to have them. And Arthur showed them. Um, I took a picture of them, of course, uh, and Arthur showed them at the Love Sexy uh, Symposium a few years ago. So that that's that's fun, and it's uh, it, well, it's. One of the things, if you dive deep into to, to the, the the myth that is Prince, then you, all th kinds of, of small things pop up. I did this for the Netherlands book, and I'm pretty sure that if anybody wants to write a similar book about Prince in Germany, Prince in the UK, or Prince in, in the US, or wherever, all these kinds of stories will pop up as well, because there's so much to tell. Yeah, and I think that's so phenomenal. It's a, It's every time something gets discovered from the vault or uncovered or, you know, some tape, some bootleg that he gave away at some point while he was creating something really pulls back this veil of this really uh, carefully articulated image that he had created, but that the demos always reveal that there's still a human and this really hu complex human that we're talking about now, especially during Dirty Mind, that there was like a calculated response in creating this image that we're talking about. And this notion that there is probably a queer man who was, who was very comfortable in his sexuality. And there's been a great conversation in the side chat here about how as a black man, uh, playing with his sexuality in this way really speaks to the level of comfort that he had both as a black man and as a heterosexual queer man. I'm going to be using that as my term now because I love it. <laughs> but I, I don't know if you, I think we had maybe a moment before the other folks come on, but maybe if you um, had some like closing remarks in response to just like the man and the myth that from both of these perspectives. Who goes first? First. <laughs> Okay. Well, the, the, the man and the myth, what, what I liked about writing the book is that um, obviously I've never met Prince, um, uh, but I, I think I discovered a little bit about the man uh, because the things that made him human, being at a hotel, working on, for instance, the, uh, the, the sexy MF uh, uh, single artwork, and then leaving the hotel room and leaving everything behind, you know, he was human, he was, he was messy. Um, and that that's something that uh, when we think of Prince, it's always this this perfect enigma, and he was he was human, and that's that's something that uh, that we should remember. And uh, and in, in the Dirty Mind era, this is all about the Dirty Mind era, of course. He also was still a human being. He was a human being who's saying, "Look at me, here I am. You have to take me the way I am." And that's that's a lesson that we all can learn from. Be confident in who you are. And that's actually what he is, his message is in, in that particular era. 
Absolutely. Right, and I would uh, echo that same idea of just the, uh, you know, how much in terms of looking at Prince as a, a person of how intentional he was and uh, of being a person and being human and how that's really, I think, what made him so mythic was that commitment to just truly being himself and expressing himself the way he wanted to. Um, and that's that, you know, that kind of that confidence that we talked about with sexuality or, and with blackness. And for most people, it's, we, it's just really difficult, I think, for most of us to live so openly and honestly. And he was just ridiculously committed to that um, and doing that on, you know, a universal stage. Um, and yeah, I think that the myth and the man are totally separate and also totally the same. Hasit, uh, Derica, Derica, correct? Derica. Derica, I'm yeah. sorry. No, okay. Thank you so much both for being here. Um, I, I loved, I, I loved your passion, Derica, because I was just, I was right there with you. And I was like, <laughs> this, tell me more, yeah. I need more. <laughs> Uh, but I actually loved both of your presentations in a way in which you both talked about the, these awakenings that were happening, uh, which I thought was phenomenal. And I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more of it. And like just referencing, because we are talking about Dirty Mind um, and talking about sexuality. One of the interesting points on the album is when Prince on the song Sister is talk like the rest of the album has these more conventional notions of sex and how experiencing sex, but sister really is referencing one of these uh, probably more traumatic, uh, very early experiences with sex. And I think it's really interesting to watch and have this really raw kind of awakening on this album. So I want to know if maybe you both could reflect on that and talk about some of your own awakenings in reference to the Dirty Mind album. Oh, yeah. I mean, who it was a, expose, right? Because one of the things is that we in our communities do not talk about sexual molestation, right? And, you know, the way he expressed it was with all that confusion, right? And man, today there's something about Prince that just makes me like bear all, but like as, um, as a person who's a survivor of that as a young child, there is always something people don't talk about, which is that confusion that happens for you sexually, because it does awaken you sexually in, in ways that are confusing because you don't want to like, right? That kind of uh, early exposure, but your brain is so not developed yet that it does become entwined with your sexuality. And I think I could resonate with that about Prince. Um, even if I consciously couldn't understand it at that young age, there was something about that contradiction. Um, and so uh, it's something we don't talk about because we don't want to create, and I don't want to create the stigma that like, you know, it, like a good salacious feeling. But the, the thing we don't talk about is that happens. Your body wakes up and your sexuality is not a bad thing. And so, but it wakes up in this really, um, the power dynamic of that. Um, and the inappropriateness of waking somebody's sexuality up when they're not able to control that that feeling or narrative or even understand it. So um, I felt some resonance with that story um, in that really confused way that he also seemed a little confused about. For sure, yeah. I don't know what happened to Prince, if anything, when he was a kid or when he was young. Um, I wonder how much of it was just performative. You know, he talked, when he talked to Chris Rock in 96, in, in I think on VH1, around the time of the Emancipation album launch, he said, in response to a question about this kind of thing, he said, well, that's just rock and roll. Um, you know, the album, the album's sexuality is so overt and so much more so than previous works that it feels like a statement but I don't know how much that relates to anything that actually happened because, you know, this, this is a guy who was a showman, he's a performer and created like every artist, fictional worlds as well. So, you know, but we'll never know. Perhaps someone in the, in the chat can correct me, but I want to say that there was a story when Prince was kicked out of his own home and he was staying with 
family friends and that there were some older siblings of those family friends and that some something inappropriate may have happened with one of those older sisters. So like not technically his blood sister, but don't know. But again, I don't know the answer to that. So that's mm -hmm. usually the story that I've heard in reference to that. But we again, he the the show the man versus the myth there. It's hard to figure out parse which is true and what isn't. Um, I, but I think it doesn't matter whether it's true. That's the narrative that he introduced to me, right? And it was confusing and titillating and all of that. So. Absolutely. Like he didn't have to meet a woman on the way to her wedding and get hit, right? Like he'd have to do that in order for it to be introduced into my 12 year old mind, so. Exactly. Introducing these narratives that were important and like opened up your mind into what they can be. That was just so super important to, uh, just the, like the formation that you were talking about, Derica. Derica. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Okay. I keep wanting to rewrite your sense. My dad is Derek. <laughs> um, there was someone really interesting, Rhonda, who was speaking during your talk and said that there needs to be an entire symposium that centers on women's sexuality and prints. Um, because I bet there's an entire generation of women whose understanding of romantic love and sex comes directly from Prince's influence. I don't even think that Hasit is uh, excused from this because of his own club experience <laughs> listening to Heads. So I just want to know like, if you could kind of talk a little bit more about that. Um, if I knew the secret, I'd use it. Um, look, this is for Tarika. I, you know, I, I can I can theorize about it. I can speak generally about it, but look, I don't know. Um, I, I I can't tell you the impacts that Prince's persona and his music and his lyrics and his you know him um, had. W what impacts that had on women? That's for Dorica to answer, not me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I you know I think one of the things that I teach in the diversity and inclusion work is that something that impacts one of us actually impacts all of us. So when Prince redefines what it means to be a man, it actually impacts men as much as it does women, right? So you know you've heard Lenny Kravitz and other people talk about like him allowing that. And I saw all these men around me wearing like, you know, ruffle shirts and embrace, like they were like, this is what the girls like? Okay, mm -hmm. all right, if this is what the girls like, then I'm gonna be about that. And, the, and then also the liberation for people who felt stuck in a box of what a man is. And I see, you know, in the chat, we're having all this conversation about queer, but I think it depends on what your definition of queer is, right? So queer can be, a person who is gay or LGBTQ plus, right? But queer is also an umbrella term for people who are stepping outside a box of sexuality. And so everything is about definition. Racist is about definition, right? Like, and it depends on what your definition is of that. I heard, I had someone who worked with Prince tell me Prince didn't like black people, right? And I was just like, huh? And I think that's their perspective around some of the decisions, some of the ones that are hurtful that we heard about last night. But the perspective is he didn't like black people. And it's like, no, he might not have liked those black people or he might not have treated them right or he might have been subject to the internalized oppression. But let me get back to the feminism question. Yes, we need that. <laughs> let me, y'all know I have a black thing. But yes, we need that conference. And yes, women need to be empowered enough to say what Prince meant to us. Um, but I think it's what he meant to all of us in terms of the way he redefined sexuality, manhood, personhood, like he just redefined everything and made a space that was like, it was just the way he was like, I don't care what other people think. I don't care what used to be. I don't care what the standard is. I don't care what radio usually does. Like this is all of me. Um, and uh, it, of course, it radicalized me as a woman. Of course it did. I think for me, um, because I came to Prince a bit later, I was, I'm a little bit younger. Not much younger, but you know, young, younger enough. Um, that space had already been created, so it was already okay for a man not to be hyper masculine in the old sense. By the time I was growing up, he was completely fine for that. So, you know, he was just an extension of that. By then, I mean, I, I wasn't around. I, mean, I was two years old in 1980 when the album came out, when Dirty Mind came out. So, I don't have a sense of kind of how profound it was at the time. What was it like for you at the time when you discovered it? I mean, just like, what was that feeling by then? I mean, look, I, so as I said in my talk, I, I, I discovered um, uh, Diamonds and Pearls when it came out and just fell in love with it. Um, and then went back to the back catalog and watched Purple Rain. And I've got a VHS tape somewhere, which is very worn out. 
you know, the mm -hmm. lake scene. Um, and then the Sun of the Times and all that stuff. And Dirty Mind came a bit later and it just blew my mind. You know, I didn't know this kind of musicality existed. I didn't know that Prince did this stuff because I hadn't heard it yet. Um, but for now, you know, now it's just part of the continuum. It's part of the kind of the process of an artist discovering himself and figuring out what works and trying new things. I mean, the trying new things stuff is so important with Prince because he, every album from 1982, I'd say 88, was something new in it. And I mentioned in my talk that Dirty Mind was the foundation stone of the edifice. I think as a creative enterprise, it's also the foundation stone. For sure, yeah. I think that, I mean, even in my discovering Prince, I was in high school or junior high. I mean, it was one of those things that was always around, but I didn't fall into the universe personally uh, until I was in high school. Um, just a little bit later than some of you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I think when I discovered it, there's something, and it's come up in the chat too, where someone was asking, what, what would it be like for a 15 year old discovering Dirty Mind today? It looks very different from when I discovered it versus when um, either of you may have first experienced it and really looking at, there is a timeless part of that of Dirty Mind where like the playing of sexuality, they're like, oh my God, he's like talking about giving head. Like we, that's even was still controversial 10 years ago where like dudes like, I don't give head. And he's talking about this you know, 30 plus years ago. So the idea of like, what do we take away from it and what's become normalized is really interesting too. I actually want to yeah. pop on just because I want to respond to what you just said. I actually discovered um, Dirty Mind as a 10 year old in real time, 1980. And when I saw that cover, it wasn't sexual to me because I didn't know what sexuality was. But what spoke to me in volumes was this freedom of expression. I knew this was a guy that could do anything. I mean, like he, that cover just, that was the beginning. I mean, it, it was like a, a switch flipped and it was instant. And I listened to the album. Um, you know, my aunt just found out a couple of years ago that she's the reason why I'm a huge Prince fan because she had the album in her album collection. I put headphones on, not because I knew it was explicit. I didn't even know what explicit was. I didn't know what he was talking about in terms of sister. I didn't know what he was talking about by head. When I um, heard 1999 as a 12 year old and I heard Little Red Corvette, I thought he was talking about horses. When he said, I was like, I, I mean, I really didn't have any context for, you know, the, the sex um, side of Prince at that early age. But what spoke volumes to me was I knew he was creative. I knew that he did not fit the box of what was expected, you know, of black people. And I just, I don't know. I was just like, where, like, where does he live? Are there more people yeah. like him? How can I right. aspire to be more like him in terms of not being afraid to express myself? And I'm turning 50 this year and I still have issues with expressing myself, you know? And so like he is this beacon of self-expression, you know, like true expression. There's this fantastic quote by Bruce Lee and I can't remember it, you know, verbatim, but he basically says something to the effect one of the hardest things to actually do is truly express yourself. So I think that Prince was the epitome of, you know, freedom of expression, self-expression. And that is why I was compelled by that Dirty Mind cover. You know, it was, it, it spoke volumes. So um, Dirty Mind is really important. So I didn't, I didn't see it as a 10 year old as like a sexual document or anything like that. Yeah, I think it depends on how present sexuality was in your life. I mean, black music was also around us. I was listening to Donna Summers, you know, you know, hot stuff and bad girl. We had Rick James who was not holding anything back at all. Right. Like there were all kinds of people around us expressing their sexual. It wasn't that anomalous. I think everybody wants to make prints like so never, nobody else was ever doing anything. But like, if you listen to the stories about George Clinton, like, I mean, people were, it was, it was going down 
all around us. Um, and then by the time we get to West Virginia, we're married. Like that, you if you like, there was not getting ready to be any question what he was talking about, right? And um, it was, oh my God, did he just say that? Like what? The taste out of your mouth, <laughs> right? And so he did that, right? Nobody. What song was about incense? What song was about hair? What song? So he did push it, but not completely. He wasn't completely out of context. Um, but what he was was that combination of things, that feminist section. That spirituality sex. It was like, oh, you can you can be all of that. And that for me, um, and for the people around me, I love the way he liberated the black men around me. I grew up in Detroit, it's 80% black. Black men were rocking all the prints, everything. And you know, playing the prints. They loved prints. They knew, you know, to put the sun, do we back? What? We was, it was all. And um, but we were too young for it to be on. But it was, right? I think that happened with rock and roll and a lot of other genres. You know, people got sexualized early and we just don't talk about it because it's, you know, quote unquote, inappropriate. 